This is in your business. 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 This is in your business for the Umsel Business Podcast. Hello and welcome back to In Your Business with Umsel Business. My name is Dylan Wibbenmeyer. I am a junior seeking a degree in business administration with an emphasis in marketing. And I have the honor of being the host for this episode. So before we begin, we would like to point out that this podcast is being hosted 100% virtually using an awesome platform called StreamYard, if you've never heard of it. Um, so it essentially just is kind of like Zoom. It lets us interact virtually so that everyone's safe, you know, all that kind of stuff. So that being said, the service also allows us to record the podcast as a video, which can be found on our Umsol Business YouTube channel if you're interested in watching as well. With all that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump right in. So today we have guests from a couple of different departments and groups within the university. Uh, since the beginning of the year, every person worldwide has had to deal with the, the new challenges and roadblocks that COVID-19 has faced us. And uh, as this new reality continues, education has obviously not been unaffected. You know, Even at the collegiate level, we've seen changes have to be made, all that kind of stuff. So uh, you know, every department university-wide has had to find meaningful solutions in the area of safety, for not only students, but faculty and staff as well. And you know anyone who may visit campus too. So first we'd like to have everyone introduce themselves, give us what department they are part of a group, and uh, give us a quick rundown of what they do and uh, their function of their department. So Justin, if you wanna kick us off, you can go ahead. Sure, thanks Dylan, I appreciate being here. Uh, my name is Justin Roberts, and I'm Assistant Vice Chancellor for Marketing and Communications at UMSL. Um, I'm also here serving as a member of the Unified Command team uh, that I I'm sure we'll talk about as we get into this, but thanks again for having me. Of course, and uh, Danielle and Megan, if you guys want to go, Danielle first. Hi, thanks for having me. I am Danielle Fawcett, the Assistant Registrar of Curriculum and Scheduling over in the Registrar's Office. Awesome. Megan? Hi everyone, my name is Megan Heiser and I am part of the scheduling team uh, at UMSL. So, oh, pardon my dog. Um, and I help day to day with the scheduling and helping to cl place classes in classrooms. Awesome, all right, Jessica. Hi everybody, my name is Jessica Long Pease. I am the Senior Director for Student Affairs and I work with our campus life operations, which include the Millennium Student Center, event services, student involvement, campus recreation, and new student programs, along with our third party contracts related to food service and vending on campus. Awesome, and last but not least, Mr. Dorian, you're up. Hello, my name is Dorian Hall. I am the Director of the Millennium Student Center and Event Services. Uh, in that role, I'm, I also have oversight of the Office of Student Involvement. Uh, as the name implies, Event Services focuses on events across campus. Uh, the Millennium Student Center, we are the, the hub of the campus, and so we're managing the day-to-day -day operations in that hub. And then with the Office of Student Involvement, we are here to support students and, and help them get engaged and stay engaged in just overall campus activities. So, Awesome. Well, thanks for being here, guys. So. First up, I'm going to ask Justin. Uh, so you talked about Unified Command. You're a part of that. So uh, why don't you tell us what that is and how it was formed? Sure. Uh, Unified Command team uh, is responsible for, in this situation, developing the university's uh, ongoing response to the pandemic. But a, a Unified Command team is also uh, something that we've had in place since I've been here. I've been on it um, for five years. Uh, it's an incident command structure that's common uh, throughout federal agencies, of course, but also in public and private uh, institutions that allow for a structure to respond to a number of issues. Uh, and those issues can range from natural disasters to, in this case, a pandemic. Uh, my work on that group has been uh, serving in the public information officer role, uh, but Whatever the, the issue of the moment is, determines who else is serving on that, that unified command team. So in response to the pandemic, we have a group of eight individuals. Uh, they uh, represent everything from health services to academic affairs to human resources, uh, facilities, student affairs, of course, media and communications, uh, institutional safety, and then administration as well. And so collectively, uh, we have met throughout this pandemic. Traditionally, a, a unified command team would be short term. You know, it, it would maybe be a 30 day response to a given issue or, or something going on. But this has been ongoing. 
and will continue to be. So this team meets, right now we're down to three times a week, uh, but what we do is review any and every issue pertaining to the pandemic and the university's response. Sure, and do you feel like this is the, the, the biggest case you'll ever have? Like, do you think the Unified Commander will ever meet this much again, or do you feel like this is... Uh, I hope this is I hope this is the biggest uh, incident that that we will ever face as a university. Um, it's certainly challenging for every university and every organization and business and and everybody has to come to the table and find their best response that meets the needs of their communities. Uh, so yeah, I, I hope this is the biggest. Sure, sure. Now, Jessica, I believe it was you that mentioned the food pantry, correct? So uh, there's, yeah, that's correct. There, there's a lot of people that use the food pantry and a lot of people who need it. So whenever campus shut down last semester, how did you guys deal with that? Like what was the main challenge for keeping this option available? I mean, I think the main option at that point was making sure that it was still accessible to students. So we you know, obviously knew that we had um, most of the campus shut down starting in March. And so it was an opportunity for us to rethink how we could operate in that food pantry space. Um, one of the things that our team in student social services did, and that's the department that works with the Triton Pantry, um, is packed up emergency food boxes right after the shutdown was announced. And then those were delivered to a handful of campus locations that were going to remain somewhat open throughout the course of the larger campus closure. So that was residential life and housing, which has responsibility for Mansion Hill and Oak Residence Hall, um, health and counseling services, and then University Meadows. And so that was an opportunity for our students to have locations they could go to and pick up those emergency packages if they needed them. Um, we also kept our graduate student on board to help with Next Steps funding. And so she worked with students um, throughout the spring and summer to locate um, food resources near where they lived or where they were staying, uh, applying for SNAP benefits. Um, and she also kept the Triton Pantry Facebook page active and posted to community resources multiple times a week so that students know where they could safely go to get food if they needed it. So that was something that we did in that immediate moment. Um, and that was probably oh. the most challenging piece was figuring out how to handle um, the, the Triton Pantry and its function for our students in that um, immediate aftermath of the campus closure. Sure. And are you still doing the food pantry this semester? How's it working out for you now? Yeah, absolutely. So they are still working throughout the course of the semester. Um, they began with a pre-order system at the start of the semester. So students who do pre-ordered, pre-scheduled pickups. Um, and they've been assessing that along the way to see what they think is working effectively and what is a little bit more challenging. Um, so the students need to schedule a particular time ahead of time, uh, remember that time, come to the pantry at exactly that time. That hasn't been super successful. Um, so they moved to a more open model where students can come uh, from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. on Mondays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays, and they'll pack a box for them at that time. Um, and then if students are not able to come to the actual pantry, um, they're having, quick conversations about where they can get their needs met other locations. So right now they're working um, you know, with some local agencies to come up with other options for students if they can't make it to campus. And then they're also looking for other items students may need that they don't have easy access to, um, like diapers um, or feminine products, those sorts of things. If we have those come in, we can provide those to students as well. Uh, we're really lucky. We have an excellent partnership with the STL Food Bank and they're delivering food to the pantry monthly. So we haven't had an issue with supply coming into the Triton Pantry and we're still working on those emergency food boxes as well. So you'll see those um, in nursing, social work, athletics, Mansion Hill, Meadows, um, all of those locations enable us to serve more students and for students to pick them up in spaces where they already are without having to go um, to another location. In particular with nursing and uh, social work, they have a lot more evening classes in those spaces. And so it's enabling students to access those resources after hours. Awesome, awesome. So, Dorian, I know you said you are the director at the Millennium Student Center, correct? And I know you uh, you guys host events and all that kind of stuff. Uh, how have you guys, is there still events going on at the Student Center? Are they doing remotely? Tell us a little bit about how that's been going on this semester. Okay. So, with the need to support some additional academic classes, because again, there were some changes with capacities for some of the academic classes on space, on campus, the Millennium Student Center had to offer up some of our larger spaces for those academic purposes. And so in the Century Rooms, essentially Monday through Friday, they're being used for uh, several classes. So which really didn't leave a lot of room available for, um, for any events or any activities. And so initially, 
also trying to kind of mitigate and, and minimize the traffic in the building, we also decided to to just not keep, uh, to not really host anything in the student center. Uh, now that we have a better sense of the traffic and things are, are gotten to a somewhat of a normal flow in, in traffic in the building, we have opened up a couple of our spaces uh, to allow for some smaller events on campus. And then in to relation to events as well, there is an events policy that was um, put together by a campus events task force. And then that policy was vetted through unified command. And as part of that policy, essentially really anything that's above 30 people is restricted unless given an exception through a steering committee that is made up of members of the campus events task force. And so that group meets on a weekly basis to review any events or any requests that come in that are above 30. Uh, truthfully, we only have about one or two of those that may come in a week. And then we're just addressing those needs or concerns that arise in those requests uh, to see if they are even feasible for the campus to support them. So we, we definitely are seeing a significant decline in the number of events that are happening on campus because of everything that's going on, but we still have a few things that are happening here and there. The vast majority right now of events are happening through virtual uh, platforms, particularly Zoom being a very popular platform being used across the campus. Yeah, absolutely. And do you, what procedures have been taken just at the student center in general, just, you know, like the small things like social distancing, all that kind of stuff, what have you done there to kind of help out with all that kind of stuff? Yeah. So we've done quite a bit in the student center. We've removed the vast majority of the uh, open public seating. We have removed a lot of the furniture down in the Nash area and spaced out the furniture so that we have six feet of distance in all of the seating remaining and remove all of the furniture, all of the community seating, which most of that sits on the south part of the Nash uh, to offline because there's just no way to really social distance that stuff, that furniture properly. Uh, we've taken the fireside lounge and the quiet lounge offline as well, because again, those places, those spaces are hard to social distance, and then the furniture that is in those spaces are just a lot harder to, to maintain on a regular flow as well. Sure, sure. All right, Danielle and Megan. Danielle, if you want to go first, tell us a little about how scheduling has been this semester. You know, obviously last semester it was all kind of going down. You know, everything was closing up as we were starting to do scheduling, all that kind of stuff. So tell us how how that kind of changed your scheduling process. Yeah, so the fall 20 schedule actually went live on March 1st, as it normally does, and then everything kind of hit, so we had to react to it instead of kind of proactively plan. Scheduling in general is like putting together an intricate puzzle, and I think this was the most difficult puzzle Megan and I have ever had to put together. <laughs> um, so, so social distancing guidelines, just guidelines that came out, kind of made it a little bit more difficult to figure out exactly how we were going to um, schedule courses on campus that could meet safely. Um, thanks to Dorian's team and other teams on campus, we were able to utilize spaces for classes that we normally wouldn't be able to utilize. We did move any courses that had an authorized capacity of 30 and up to online, um, unless it was pedagogically necessary. So we just kind of strategically looked at what we could do. And Megan really did a lot of the legwork. So I'll let her speak to kind of how she strategically handled that. Yeah, like Danielle said, scheduling is a big puzzle. And so when we got tasked with figuring out what could be done with the fall schedule, it really was just putting all of the pieces together. So I'm sure if you've been in any of the classrooms, you've noticed that they are spaced out a little bit differently. Um, they do not hold as many students as they normally have would have um, facilities did an amazing job of getting into the classrooms and rearranging the furniture, blocking seats off so that way we could ensure that students were maintaining that six foot distance within the classroom as well. But that also meant that the capacities of our classrooms were greatly reduced. So we had to move quickly to determine how many classes could we even fit on campus um, given the new capacities. And then we also wanted to make sure that um, there was enough time before and after classes for students to either get into the classroom or leave the classroom without running into a lot of traffic. So um, it was just figuring out by testing what would work and what wouldn't. And we did come to the conclusion that we just couldn't hold classes that had 30 or more students on campus, or at least all of them. So we made that um, step to move those online. And then it was just putting the puzzle together. So it did all come together for fall through a lot of amazing teamwork. And so now we're trying to um, create something just as 
safe for our students for spring 2021. How has this impacted future scheduling practices for you guys? Like, how has this changed how you look at the future of scheduling? I think that it has changed the future of scheduling in a very drastic way. I think primarily we've kind of strengthened those supports across campus that we already had, but we've all come together to strategically do what was necessary for the campus and our community. And I think going forward, we're going to keep those um, partnerships and we're going to make sure that we're really utilizing them. I think it also made us very aware of what our software could do, what we could do, and kind of building it all together in a more um, holistic way than we did before. Sure. Well, it seems like you guys have had a lot of uh, stuff to do with there over at scheduling, just trying to figure out where everything fits together. Like you said, it's a big puzzle. So that seems like it's been a, an interesting semester for you guys. Uh, so Justin, so we've talked about a little bit about the unified command. So whenever we talk about like uh, cases, uh, positive cases, how is that collected and how is that shared with, uh, with the public? Sure. Um, so what we've asked members of our community to do is to monitor their health care daily. Um, and if, if you have issues that are atypical of your current health situation that are, are aligned with symptoms, that one, you stay at home. And then next, you reach out to the health services uh, unit. We do have a form that's on our Start Safe, Stay Safe website. Uh, that you can fill out to show symptoms and then a person from health services will reach out to that individual so be sure to answer your phone and be responsive and they'll discuss your situation and determine if there is a need to uh, either remain uh, uh, you know away from campus or if you need to get testing they will arrange for that but certainly anyone that uh, has symptoms and tests positive there is, again, another form. You are required to report that to the university, at which point uh, you should remain off campus or in isolation on campus if you, you live in on-campus housing. Uh, but our, our numbers have been what I, I would say to be relatively low. Certainly, we've watched universities across the country that have had dramatic spikes at the beginning of their, their fall semester. Uh, we report out on our active cases weekly on the Start Safe, Stay Safe website. Uh, so you can go there and see active cases for students as well as faculty and staff. And again, we update those on Fridays. Awesome. So did the university, whenever we're interacting with all this kind of stuff, did they engage with local, state, or federal public officials to like communicate uh, on how to respond and all that kind of stuff? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, we, we were highly collaborative, uh, not only from Unified Command, but our our university administration as well. So from where we sit within the UM system, we do have a system-wide emergency response manager. And that individual was critical in bringing our four campuses together and was also that conduit with, with state health officials. And of course, we worked locally uh, quite a bit with St. Louis uh, Health Department, as well as uh, city and county officials. Uh, statewide, we met frequently uh, with all public higher education institutions to talk about our response. That was coordinated through the Missouri Department of Higher Education. Uh, as we look at athletics, we were uh, highly engaged with the Great Lakes Valley Conference in our approach to bringing back athletics to the fall. Uh, locally, we partnered with uh, Washington University, for example, because we have a joint engineering program. So we were very, uh, engaged with their response as well. And of course, just following what uh, other universities, not only regionally, but also across the country were doing in their response and trying to adopt some of those best practices. And then lately, uh, we've been working with uh, healthcare providers. For example, this past week, uh, Athenia Healthcare worked with us through a grant with uh, the St. Louis County to provide pop-up COVID testing on our campus. And then we work with Quest Labs to provide on-site testing for those who may not be able to get to one of our community testing facilities. So yes, highly engaged, highly collaborative, and, and we continue to be. Awesome. Well, it seems awesome. like with awesome. everyone like talking, you know, everyone has their, their, uh, their input and everyone's put in a lot of work and interacted across campus. And it's good to see that you're also, you know, connecting to people outside of campus, all those kind of sources. So it seems like what this has definitely brought about is 
a lot of more unity across campus and also, like I said, interacting outside of campus, which is awesome. Uh, so Jessica, how have they dealt with uh, clubs on campus, you know, activities, all that kind of stuff? How's that been going? You know, I think it's been a slow start for the semester when we talk about uh, student engagement, but I don't think that it's missing. And I think that's the important thing to note. Um, Dorian and his team and the student center and this you know, team and student involvement have been a, doing a really great job of providing virtual programming and, and offering opportunities for students to stay connected in that virtual environment. Um, and we don't want those things to be passive programs so that they're you know, sitting there and watching something the whole time. So um, University Program Board has a, a painting night coming up in about two weeks. They're gonna be sending supplies to people um, through the mail so that they'll have those. Um, and then they'll participate um, in real time with uh, the company that they've contracted with. So we're trying to offer those programs um, and activities that are gonna be engaging um, and allow people to interact with other students because that's really what we're seeing the students say that they want at this point is an opportunity to connect with one another because that's a lot of why you get engaged in the classroom and, and why you become involved outside of the classroom. Um, we have some really strong student groups too that are, are staying really active and providing different opportunities, um, Associated Black Collegian, Student Government Association, um, some of our student organizations in criminology and criminal justice. We're seeing a lot of those organizations stay active in this moment and make sure they're connecting with students that are in their academic programs as well. And I think that's really um, great to see. One of the things that I think is awesome is we had our student organization uh, leadership training at the beginning of the school year. So that first Saturday after classes started um, and they had more than 100 student leaders show up for that close to about 160, I believe, showed to um, participate in that program. So they were learning about platforms they could use. They were learning about ways that they could safely um, host face to face programs, um, learning about the services and supports that exist within um, you know, the student center and within uh, student involvement to help them as they start to plan those and think of ways they can continue to connect. And I think that's incredibly important. Um, I think the other piece to that too is just what's happening in student affairs in general. I mean, all of the offices in the division are committed to providing support for the students in, in ways that they can connect in and uh, make sure that they feel supported in the moment. So you're seeing a lot of things in, in campus recreation that are happening, new student programs, um, residential life and housing. Everyone's um, coming together to try to make sure that our students feel connected as best they can in this moment because we wanna see that momentum continue um, through the fall into the spring. And then hopefully when we're back into a more normal pattern of traffic on campus um, and the upcoming semester. So that's definitely something we're focused on right now. Yeah, what was the process to determine like the policies and guidelines of like how to how to interact with students, all that kind of stuff? Like what how did how did those processes come about? Right. Well, Dorian mentioned the Campus Events Task Force, which I think was an incredibly important group. Um, and pulling that team of folks together, we were looking at representatives from academic areas, um, individuals that hosted um, events just because they were responsible for planning them for the campus. So a lot of our event planners, um, our venue operators in our different spaces that see different types of um, clients, whether they're internal clients like student organizations and campus departments or their external groups. Um, so we wanted to make sure we had a good group of people coming together from a number of different areas and having a conversation about what made sense. Um, higher ed had a lot of information floating around this summer um, in terms of best practices, things that we could do to keep our community safe. And I think Justin touched on a lot of those collaborative um, com conversations that are happening amongst not only the UM system, but the other institutions um, in the area and nationally. And we use the best practice information to guide what we were doing. So, you know, Danielle mentioned if we had classes um, that were 30 and under, we could place those fairly easily. That was something that the registrar's office worked really well um, at getting that put into place. We did something similar with events. If we're not gonna allow classes more than 30 to meet, um, we shouldn't have events that are longer. Um, and so we worked through that process of saying, this is kind of our threshold. Once we exceed that threshold, then we need to have a vetting process in place. And that team really worked on what those requirements should be, um, you know, health and safety policies, advertising you're going to do to let folks know that um, these are the things that you're doing to keep them safe, but that doesn't mean that they're not going to be exposed. I'm looking at all those different components and saying um, this makes the most sense to protect our campus community, which is going to be the heart of what we're trying to do is protect our students, faculty, and staff first and foremost. Um, and then from that point, do we have capacity as a campus to permit other folks to come and use our spaces in a way that makes sense both for the campus um, and for those entities? So it, it was a multi-week process. There was a lot of information to come through. And 
we had some really great feedback conversations with Unified Command and with our executive policy group to really put that um, entire process in place. And I, I'm really impressed with how our campus has responded in terms of adhering to those guidelines and making sure they're asking questions if things um, don't make sense for them. So um, Dorian's team and the campus um, events task force has been doing a great job of reviewing those because we're seeing five to six event requests per week that come through that process. So there's definitely things still happening on campus. Awesome, awesome. Dorian, what is what is the number one thing that you've learned from this experience working in the student center and seeing the, the big changes that have happened? What, have, what is the, the biggest thing? Can you repeat that question? I'm sorry, you cut out for a second. No, you're all good. What is what do you think is the the biggest thing you've learned? You know, working in a student center and then seeing all these changes. What 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 is that biggest takeaway that you have so far? I don't think there was anything new that I learned that I didn't already know. And what I mean by that is I worked with the student center for a number of years, and the top thing that I've learned is to be flexible, to be able to work together and collaborate and, and, and move through every situation as best you can. And I think that's been very evident through all of this that we've had to do with preparing for bringing the campus back uh, during this pandemic, but then also continue to keep the campus operating. Is that what we thought and held, held as this is the law and this has to be this way, some of those things we literally just had to throw away because it didn't, it just didn't make sense anymore. Or it didn't permit us to keep this campus as safe as we wanted to keep the campus safe. or permitted us to even conduct business in a reasonable amount of time. And so learning to be flexible, even with things that we thought were had to happen a certain way, I think that was what I learned most from this experience. Perfect example of that is in all the years that I've worked with the student center, we never had classes in the student center. And I have several classes every single day in the century rooms. That was never permitted, never allowed. If you ask, the answer was gonna be no. And that was the law for the MSC celebrates 20 years being open this month. And this is the first time in, in for to the best of my knowledge, in those 20 years that we've had classes in those spaces with any type of consistency. So that's that's what I mean. We have to be flexible. We have to do what we can to. So do you think that maybe things. classes will be allowed there more often from here on out? Like maybe every once in a while, even after all this is over? Who knows? It, it really just depends on how how things progress. And I mean, there's a lot of conversations we were having about this is what COVID has changed, being in this pandemic has changed, but how do we come out of it different? And some of that, we still don't quite know what that looks like because it's still evolving. Things are still changing. We're still navigating different situations and new situations, not as maybe frequently as we did over the summer, but we're still having different challenges and things that we're navigating. And I would like to think that um, as we come out of this, we may be more open to things that we haven't done in the past. But again, until we fully come out of this pandemic, it's hard to say exactly right, where right. we're going. I think I think one of the things that a lot of us have learned is that, you know, when this first started, it was like, when is this going to be over? You know, this this long quarantine, it's going to be done. And I think we're starting to realize that this is maybe a new reality. You know, things are going to change. Things are never going to be, you know, exactly the same again. So we got new new things to face, uh, new new obstacles every day. So uh, we'll just have to see, you know, what sticks and what doesn't, because I'm sure, sure some things won't change. Uh, well, uh, I believe that's all I have uh, when it comes to questions for our guests today. I want to thank each one of you for taking the time out of your hectic schedules to uh, talk with me today, learn some new stuff. So that was awesome. Um, on behalf of everyone at UMSL, I just want to thank you guys for all the hard work you guys do, uh, you know, keeping each one of us safe, making sure that, we, you know, we are still getting the learning experience uh, you know that we that we want while also remaining safe so that's that's obviously really hard for you guys to do and i think that i believe it was jessica said collaborative conversation uh, i really like that i think after after doing this that's that's definitely seemed like the key with all you guys interacting uh different departments talking talking out to outside sources all that kind of stuff so that seems like the way that uh umsl has really handed it has been working together getting that unified command team together making sure that everyone's on the same page and that student safety is first priority. So that's really good to see. Uh, for our listeners, I'd like to reiterate that this podcast was done 100% virtually. And if you if you would like to watch the podcast, it will be posted on the UMSL Business YouTube channel. So uh, thank you for listening to this episode of In Your Business with UMSL Business. And remember to wear a face mask, practice social distancing, and be safe, Tritons.